You know they have the new uh, readers for the patient thing in the ICU. Mm -hmm. I think it's a laser light, and the, and the woman, one of the nurses, was sitting there, and she was spacing her turn rounds, and I'm look up, and I've got this laser light through my eyes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I talked with uh, the fellows when we set up a, the schedule for lectures, and um, one of the topics that came up was this one, and um, we wanted to talk about exacerbations of COPD, and recently we've published a guideline, the ACCP has published a guideline on acute exacerbations of COPD, and I was part of that uh, effort. And so I'm going to present to you a little bit about what we did and talk a little bit not only about this guideline in particular and the recommendations, but also about how uh, a guideline is developed and how we go about doing this process. This was a guideline that came about the inception was about two years ago, and the American College of Chest Physician was approached by the Canadian Thoracic Society. Canadian Thoracic Society was very interested in doing a targeted guideline on COPD. And their interest really was um, they wanted a guideline that was relatively small uh, and that focused on one area, and we decided that an area that was worthy of study was prevention of acute exacerbation. Uh, and so we, we developed a guideline based on, on that concept. Hopefully this will work. If not, we'll resort to this. So here's some learning objectives. We're going to talk about why COPD exacerbations of import, are important. But the other three learning objectives are those that are based on the areas that we studied. And that includes non-pharmacologic therapies, inhaled therapies, and oral therapies. Those are how we divided the questions. So um, we wanted to create a useful clinical document to describe the current state of the art, and we wanted to use proper evaluation tools to look at the literature and to develop um, uh, evidence-graded approach to the management of COPD exacerbations. The executive committee of our guideline included co-chairs Jerry Kreiner and Jean Bourbeau from Canada, and then the remainder of the executive committee is here. And our panelists are listed here for you. These are the individuals who are involved in um, developing this guideline. And this is a complicated slide. But the reason I'm showing this to you is to give you an idea of what we go through when we develop a clinical guideline. The first thing that you want to do is to develop a protocol or a, an objective, a plan, about how, what you're going to look at. And then you create an analytic framework and, and select specific PICO questions. And I'm going to talk about what a PICO question is in general and about what PICO questions we picked for this topic. You establish inclusion and exclusion criteria for studies, which you're going to involve in this. In this. You design a search strategy, and then you select these studies. These studies are then carefully reviewed. And what we initially do is we take um, a list of studies and we look at titles and abstracts to see which apply. Some of them will not apply to the topic at hand, but others will. And so some of these you want to, you have to review uh, their complete text in order to decide whether they're going to be excluded. And then after you've done that, uh, we select studies for inclusion and then we assess the quality of these studies by looking at several different criteria, internal and external validity, relevance of design, consistency and coherence, precision, and directness to the question. Some will be rejected, but those that remain will have the results uh, extracted that we then critically analyze. So that sounds kind of confusing. So what does this really mean? What it really means is that the group of docs that you saw on the first two slides sit down and come up with several questions that we think are important. And these are called PICO questions. And PICO stands for Population, Intervention, the Control Group, and the Outcome. And for this study, we picked three. And I'll show you exactly what they are. So the, uh, the, the first committee picked those three questions. And on our committee, we have some uh, people who are expert methodologists. They're not doctors. They're experts in library science, experts in doing research during doing systematic reviews. And what they do after we've established what kind of studies do we want to have in, 
to answer those questions. They do a search strategy and they search globally using all of the tools that you know about to come up with a massive listing or library of articles which might be relevant to the three questions. And then they get abstracts and titles for all of those. And what we do then is divide them up and go through them all, decide whether or not they're relevant. And those that are relevant, um, we then assess. And to assess this, what it really means is you've got an Excel spreadsheet with criteria and you have to go through each study and pick out whether or not it's relevant or qualified for, for the, the study. You extract the results, which means you go to each study that you've selected for study and pull out the specific things, the number of patients, the confidence intervals, the p-values, and so forth for each outcome. And then for each of the PICO questions, what you really do is a meta-analysis to come up with the results to um, then assess the data. So it's a massive project that involves a lot of people. And the only way you can do even a small guideline like this is to have about 20 people, each of which, each of whom have a piece of this and, and go through this. So it's, it's quite an extensive process. There are two types of statements that can come out of a guideline. One can either be a recommendation and the other can be a suggestion. A recommendation is something that you say that you have strong evidence for, whereas a suggestion is something that you think is true but you don't have such strong evidence for. When you grade recommendations, we have several grades, and these grades are based on a tool called the grade instrument, but either the grade can either be one, which means the benefits clearly outweigh risks and burdens, or the risks and burdens clearly outweigh benefits, or it can be grade two, which means that the situation is more closely balanced. And then you grade the evidence also that supports the recommendation, whether it's high quality, moderate quality, or low quality. And so for any recommendation that one were to make, you've either got a strong or a weak recommendation, and you've either got strong supporting evidence or moderate or less. So every, every uh, element gets at, at least two grades, a one or a two, and an A, B, or C. The reason that's important is not everybody does that. Some people try to, com some organizations try to combine the different types of grades and so forth, but in the ACCP we feel that being more careful about say stating specifically whether it's a strong recommendation and whether or not the evidence is strong is important. So for example, you might feel, or a panel might feel, that a recommendation is really important. You know, you really should do X, Y, or Z in a certain situation. But when you go and look at the evidence, it's not very, very good. So you might say, well, it's a grade one thing, but the, the evidence supporting it is only B or C. Whereas it, you may not be sure after reviewing the evidence that a certain treatment or intervention is very important or that it outweighs very much the, the, what the risks, and be, risks of, of doing that. And yet the evidence may be really good. There may be very high quality studies that address the issue. And so that's important. So what do we do then? When we get a recommendation for a, a specific question, that recommendation, there's a text recommendation. You should or shouldn't do something, and there's a grade. And then all of the people that you saw on the panel vote on this. And we have a formal voting process. Do we agree with that or not? And in order for a vote to pass, it has to reach 80% of it, of the people say for, strongly for that recommendation. If that's not the case, then what we do is we reword the definition, we re reword the recommendation. And this goes around in a circular process until 80% of the group agree that that's what we want to say. That's how, how the recommendations are achieved. So let's turn to the COPD question. First of all, we would had to define exacerbation. So we said that's an event where somebody with COPD needs antibiotics or systemic steroids or both. That seemed pretty obvious. And we graded severity by looking at these sorts of things, which seemed pretty obvious. People were admitted to the ER, or readmitted to hospital, or had to have mechanical ventilation. That sounded serious to us. So that was a severe um, exacerbation. And these are the three PICO questions. So the patients, in a PICO question again, population, intervention, control group, and outcome. Population were patients with COPD, greater than 40, previous or current smoker, post-bronchodilator, uh, FEV1 to FEC. Yeah, we use 70, uh, uh, Zach, but we did that just because of simplicity, and that's the way the studies are written. 
and then we said they're at risk for an exacerbation. Okay. And PICO-1 was to look at non-pharmacologic therapies, two was to look at inhaled therapies, and three was to look at oral therapies, and that's the intervention. The control group were people who didn't receive that, and the outcomes were usually, because we were looking at prevention of acute exacerbation of COPD, an index that showed that COPD exacerbations were prevented. So those were our three PICO questions. And in PICO-1, so each one of these questions then had a number of sub-questions. These are the elements in non-pharmacologic treatments that we looked at. Pneumococcal vaccines, influenza, smoking cessation, rehab, different kinds of plans, and telemonitoring. In terms of pneumococcal vaccine, we suggested that the pneumococcal vaccine was good. So what does this mean? It's a 2C recommendation, or it's a 2C suggestion. That means that the, the data was not strong enough to support um, giving a recommendation for the pneumococcal vaccine, and the evidence backing this up was not, not very robust. What does that mean for you? Does it mean you shouldn't give the pneumococcal vaccine? No. What it means is that the data that show that giving your COPD patients a pneumococcal vaccination, that that prevents exacerbations, that evidence doesn't exist or it's not very good. And so it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. In fact, we suggest that you should do it. But this tells you something about the quality of the evidence. We th thought that um, this has a high value for people who are, have um, for general health. And we noted that multiple bodies recommend this intervention, um, but the evidence isn't really strong. So that's something we should do. Well, how about the flu vaccine, this was a recommendation, not a suggestion. And the reason is that the um, evidence is better for this. So we again think that the CDC and WHO uh, recommended this, but we thought that there was some good data that supported that this actually prevented uh, exacerbations. So we found that there were 11 studies, six in patients with COPD, and two of those studies were specifically looking at exacerbation rates. And we found that in some of the studies, in the two studies that were done in this way, that there was a reduction in, um, in COPD exacerbation. So you should give the flu ex vaccine to your patients. In terms of smoking cessation, um, smoking cessation counseling and treatment um, was suggested as a, a measure to prevent COPD with, again, a low grade of evidence and a low C value. And the reason for this was is we suggested it because we thought that there was a high value in doing this. But um, there's not good evidence-based intervention that this improves prognosis from COPD exacerbations, um, although it does improve prognosis <coughs> in COPD overall. What evidence exists suggests that there are symptom reductions and there's less lung function decline upon sustained cessation. cessation. So yes, smoking cessation is good for patients with COPD. Its ability to prevent exacerbations is less robust. When we looked at pulmonary rehab, we found a great number of studies that are looking at pulmonary rehab in terms of uh, preventing exacerbations of COPD. Here you can see hospital admissions for patients with recent exacerbations, hospital admissions without, and this is the forest plot that we developed for um, the, these studies. And you can see that there's some, some favor, uh, somewhat in favor of um, pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, what we found was that in patients who had had an exacerbation within four weeks, the pulmonary rehabilitation prevented acute exacerbations. But in those past four weeks, we didn't suggest that. That sounds kind of confusing at first glance, so let me explain. Um, again, using the, the ideas about guideline science and about the way that these things are worded, what this actually means. <clears throat> All of us think that pulmonary rehabilitation probably has some benefits in our COPD patient. And COPD and rehabilitation should be a good thing that we should advise our patients. When you look specifically, at exacerbations of COPD and outcomes, preventing exacerbations of COPD. 
what you find is that if somebody has had a COPD exacerbation within the last month and you enroll them in pulmonary rehabilitation, you are likely to reduce their, the occurrence of exacerbations in that population in the future. If they have had uh, an exacerbation more than four weeks ago, then enrolling them in pulmonary rehab will not prevent an exacerbation. It may be good for the patient, it may be something that you want to do, but it won't prevent future exacerbations. And I think actually that the recommendation is important because what it suggests is, is that if somebody has had an exacerbation in the last four weeks, if you want to prevent future exacerbations, you should enroll them in rehab. The other patients will benefit from it in other ways, maybe not in prevention of exacerbation, but in those who've had a recent exacerbation, they should be enrolled in pulmonary rehab. Is that outpatient or inpatient? Those are people, so the exacerbation could be either. So if they've... Outpatient rehab, I mean, is that outpatient rehab or inpatient? Outpatient rehab, yeah. If you have a one C recommendation, so maybe one study that shows that, do you know? Right, so in terms of A, B, or C, um, I, I went through that slide briefly, but in, in slide A, that means that there are randomized controlled studies which exist, which are large and convincing. Uh, for an evidence grade of B, it means that you have one small um, randomized control prospective style or good observational data, good retrospective data, and C means that it's mostly observational or retrospective. <clears throat> so that means that the group felt strongly that this was a good recommendation, but the evidence grade to support that was not robust in terms of prospective studies. And the reason that that I think is so important is, is two things. It shows that there's value in doing the intervention. Um, in, in this day when we're thinking about readmissions to hospital for COPD, knowing that is important. It also shows an area where research would be very well warranted because it means that all, even though we think very strongly that that's an important recommendation, there isn't robust research. And that would clearly be an area that you would want to want to do research. So I think that's important. The second one is a little harder to wrap your, get your head around because it's talking about um, we don't suggest pulmonary rehab. It doesn't mean that we don't suggest it for patients with COPD or that pulmonary rehab doesn't have other benefits. It means that pulmonary rehab in that group of patients will not prevent exacerbation. So the the outcome that you're looking at is prevention of exacerbations and not other outcomes. And that's no, all. I hope it doesn't uh, get observed the wrong way, right? And we, that's, that's exactly what we worried about too, but mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's, there's, all, there's going to be um, some implementation articles about this and so forth that explain that further. And, and that's exactly something that we were concerned about and that, that needs to be developed further. <clears throat> because the recommendation is just looking at that one outcome and not at other things. But, you know, if you're Jeff and you're looking at your hospitalized patients and you don't want them to come back in a month, enrolling them in rehab is important. And practically, it's very really difficult to get somebody within four weeks in a rehab program anywhere logistically. Exactly, so but that and that's where the data is, though. And we talked about that, too, because that, that really is a big deal. So there was a high value of pulmonary rehab in terms of reducing the risk of hospitalizations. And there's well established, it's been well established that it improves quality of life, exercise tolerance, and dyspnea. So when you read the overall article, what you'll see, what you'll read is exactly kind of what we talked about, that we acknowledge that pulmonary rehab has all of these benefits and that this second <coughs> recommendation is simply referring to acute exacerbations. <coughs> Dr. Uh, what was the definition in terms of time frame for the acute exacerbation? So what do you mean exactly? I mean, this the exacerbation within six months or within one month, when you say prevent acute exacerbation of COPD. So whenever you think that the last exacerbation ended, if you could put a date on that, having an exacerbation within the subsequent four weeks. Four weeks, okay. So having a new one. Okay, so if somebody has had one, then if you start rehabilitation within that four week period, there's evidence that you will prevent net new exacerbations. But if they're more than four weeks past their last exacerbation, pulmonary rehab may help you with quality of life, exercise tolerance, dyspnea, but it won't prevent exacerbations. I, I, it bothers me. 
Yeah. It bothers you the way it's worded, right? And, but you know, it's, it's, and I don't know the article. I cannot really uh, comment more. But is it really the pulmonary rehab, or is the fact that these patients are getting educated with it for weeks, and now they're using their inhalers? Uh, but that's, I mean, there are so many things that come to mind right. about the time frame of what makes right. that difference. So if you look, I don't see here. So what we tried to do was to look for studies that separated that piece out. And I'm going to tell you about that in a minute because there is, there are studies that look specifically at, at education and case management and so forth outside of the pulmonary rehab box. So it seemed like from the studies we looked at that that we're looking at pulmonary rehab alone that it had benefit. You know, it's the same, the word thing is because it, with the smoking cessation, they're not recommending it to quit smoking mm -hmm. or if you get sick to suggest it. So it's, how, so it's just the words and how people say it. Right, right. And it has to do with what, what a guideline is mm -hmm. and what it says and we're looking at a specific outcome. Yeah. Right. Which is why I'm talking about this and explaining that and that's, that is explained in the text of the main thing and it's why there's going to be companion articles too because that's important. So how about education and case management alone? We suggested that this should not be used for prevention of acute exacerbation. Um, so this is confusing a little bit too. So education alone or case management alone don't prevent acute exacerbations. If you use education together with an action plan, um, this does not prevent acute exacerbations either. Right. Well, the thing is, if you use all three of these things, education, case management, and direct access to a healthcare specialist, we did find that that would lead to preventing severe acute exacerbations. So either education alone, case management alone, or the two together by themselves, none of those things prevented acute exacerbations. If you combine that with access to a healthcare specialist, then you could show that there was prevention of acute exacerbations. What do you mean by healthcare specialist? Like a doctor or a PA. So if you had a program that provided if you just give them educational materials, that's not going to prevent an exacerbation. <laughs> if you give them med case management, so you have a case manager assigned, that by itself isn't going to do it, or the two together won't prevent it. If, on the other hand, you have a physician or a physician assistant who's involved in the management of that patient and is available to see that patient and so forth along with those things, then you can show that there's a reduction in acute exacerbations. Is a pharmacist in the for that? I don't. I'd have to look at the specifics of the study that were involved, which I, I didn't. I, w I didn't do that, so I don't know if if that's considered to be a healthcare professional or not. And then at least monthly. What is the meaning of that in your uh, in what you worked on? Like monthly or how many? Months? That means they had access with an appointment at least once a month. Yes, sir. This recommendation follows what <coughs> we discovered when we were accident that you had to do acute frequently. It wasn't a one-shot deal. That, it didn't, that didn't work. That didn't work. Right. So if you did this stuff monthly, right. then the numbers would come up. And what I, what I would want to, Hector, what I would want to emphasize, for, for one thing, the, the guideline recommendations are focused on the specific outcome of prevention of exacerbations. Mm -hmm. And the second is the language derives from the articles that we looked at. So um, the monthly thing meant, and I'm not sure exactly how they organized their clinic in that situation, but it meant that these people had access at least once a month to an appointment with a doctor, PA, a healthcare provider that was focused on their COPD problem. Yeah, no, because I don't know how to apply this to practice. That's my thing here. I understand what you're writing, <coughs> but I don't know how to apply it. So it's why the TCM or transition case manager, all that from CMS, you get our patients back to see their PCP within one week, and that's like hospital right now is the guidelines. So that's why all these patients turn around because it doesn't have to be a pulmonologist, but the amount of reason in the heart failure literature about something for that follow up. And so we, you know, everything's working right now just 30 days because that's probably the efficient, but a lot of this is further. 
Right, and, and I think that's exactly what it is. So instead of just getting pamphlets or just having case manager assigned, if you have that follow-up appointment piece that's in, in the algorithm, then that is shown to, to help. Well, maybe you haven't got it to it yet in future slides here, but you know, to me it seems like the one missing ingredient in all this is, hey, the patient should get up and around. You know, rehab or not rehab, the one that gets up and around and starts moving around is the one that's going to do better whether it's post-operatively, you know, COP exacerbation right. or anything else. And that's the one thing that rehab has that the other stuff doesn't work, but just getting around it. The patient that sees his doctor more often, he's the guy that's getting up and coming in. The guys that cancel out a month later, the ones sitting under Twitch and watching TV. Yeah. Uh, so has anybody looked at that aspect? Which, you know, in other words, the heck with rehab, just tell the patient at home is kind of like uh, Brenna's uh, yoga type thing. You know, the patients you get up and doing stuff, uh, are they the ones that don't come back again? Well, I think that the answer is that all of these are grade C recommendations, so the evidence to support even this is pretty light, and, and there there isn't data about that kind of a thing. Was Brian here, Brian? She was. She was. She was. collecting any data on that. Yeah, they don't. Good for her. Good for her. So there were two um, studies that looked at this in particular that had positive results, and there was one negative study. Um, and the outcome that was looked at was decreased hospitalizations. Um, this is the forest plot for the education plan and case management, which is pretty close to the, the unity line. So we did suggest a written action plan and case management for prevention, 2B. And, um, there was one study that showed increased mortality. Okay. We looked at telemonitoring because there was a little bit of data about telemonitoring available. And what we found was that um, we didn't have, uh, we suggested it, but there was not very much data to suggest that it helped very much. So in terms of the first PICO question, which I think in some ways was the hardest involving non-pharmacologic therapy, we recommended flu vaccine, pulmonary rehab, and a, com a combined approach with education, case management, and monthly follow-up, and suggested were the pneumococcal vaccine, smoking cessation. Both of those are high priority items that we should be doing, but had low evidence about preventing exacerbations. Are there any questions about that? Um, case management and education means, I think it meant action plan. SM means, meant, had a definition for that. I think it just meant an educational program, Paul. Dan, yes. What, what has been your experience with action plans, not just for COPD, but for asthma? Well, I don't think they're always followed very closely or very well. Right. So I think that, that the studies that were done um, included them uh, with case management and a physician involvement, giving someone an action plan by itself. As, as shown here, didn't make a difference. Yeah. Our second question, the second PICO question, was to look at inhaled therapies for uh, prevention of uh, COPD exacerbation. And the data drove some of this. Um, we looked at short acting beta agonists and muscarinic agonists, antagonists versus placebo and long acting beta agonists long-acting muscarinic versus placebo, and then to each other, and inhaled corticosteroids in the combination of beta agonists plus inhaled corticosteroids. This is long-acting bronchodilators compared to placebo or monotherapy with a short-acting bronchodilator. And there was generally evidence that long-acting bronchodilators were effective. Um, the rate of adverse effects were similar between long-acting beta agonists and placebo arms. And I think that's interesting because we talk about, in asthma patients, long-acting beta agonists having adverse effects. 
And in COPD patients, that wasn't found to necessarily be true, at least in the studies that we looked at. And we also found that long-acting beta agonists didn't impact mortality, but there was strong safety data and there were benefits in other um, elements of COPD management. So in patients with moderate to severe COPD, we recommended a long-acting beta agonist compared to placebo to prevent exacerbations. And I think that's important data. Um, reduced risk of exacerbations. Uh, there aren't significant differences between in adverse events. And I think the safety data is important. This is long-acting mus muscarinic antagonist compared to placebo, and there was generally good evidence for this. And in fact, this is a 1A recommendation that was um, probably the, one of the strongest that we had, is to recommend a long-acting muscarinic antagonist to prevent exacerbations. Um, so they reduced the risk, and um, it didn't show all. It didn't reach. Uh, show reduction in COPD hospitalizations, but showed improvement in exacerbation rates. And there also, it seems to be safe with no long-acting serious safety data. So then we looked at long-acting muscarinic antagonists compared to long-acting beta agonists. And I think this is interesting because you can see some evidence that the long-acting muscarinic um, antagonists should be preferred to long-acting beta agonists alone. <clears throat> so comparing the two drugs, long-acting muscarinic antagonists and long-acting beta agonists, there's evidence that the muscarinic antagonists are better. So if you're looking at, so it would suggest that drugs like ipratropium uh, are better than salmeterol or fomoterol by themselves doesn't talk about combinations, um, and it doesn't talk about the use of multiple agents. Just looking at one compared to the other, the, the llamas were more likely to reduce risk of acute exacerbations. T-tropium, I, I misspoke, sorry. Yeah, you're correct. Um, in looking at short-acting muscarinic antagonists and short-acting beta agonists, David, yes. Is Turnosa included in the long-acting of sclerosidae? Turnosa, aquavinium. Do you know if that's included in the long-acting one since it's a BID drug? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Right. I don't know if that was included in our study, but in, in what we looked at, if that was one of them. But yes. Short-acting agents, there was none to um, evaluating exacerbation as a primary endpoint. The, what, the studies that we did have um, had bias risk, and um, the evidence quality was very moderate. So we didn't really have sufficient data to address that. There was a suggestion, therefore, a 2C suggestion that short-acting muscarinic antagonists compared to beta agonists are probably better, but again, the data is weak. So we're talking placing someone. I'm just trying to see how this will be interpreted in the whole community. So, in that, so the problem is, is that none of us treat most of our patients with one agent or the other, and yet that's how the studies are done. No, neither. I haven't gotten to that yet. So this is this is ipratropium versus albuterol. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. So you are mentioning that they do better with a long-acting uh, muscarinic. Correct. Ipratropium. Right. They do better with a short-acting muscarinic. Correct. Okay. So I'm just thinking of. So the thing to keep in mind, though, so the thing to keep in mind is if you look at a long-acting beta agonist compared to placebo, long-acting beta agonists are more likely than placebo to prevent an exacerbation. If you look at a long-acting muscarinic compared to placebo, the llama is better. If you look at llamas versus labas, the llama is better. What it doesn't say is what happens to the patient, should you have the patient on both 
the llama and the lava and the inhaled corticosteroid and so forth, which is what we end up doing, right? Or the llama or the sun, let's say internal medicine. Exactly. Let's say, so they put them in the so, and hepatrophic. Right, so where the data, so, so the data doesn't always take you where our, our patients do, right. and, our, and that's important to know. I think that what this tells us is that there is data that these drugs prevent exacerbations, which I think by itself is important to know. And it's important to know that there's good quality data for some of them. And I think also if you're going to talk about one agent for versus another when you're talking about cost effectiveness, to know that a llama has some better data than a lava is probably important to know. Because if you only had to pick one of those agents, that should direct where, what you would pick. And I think that's important. Was it clarified in these guidelines that you, there is no re, is no recommendation to use the same type of medication, short and long acting, in the same patient? And for this, I see this could cause confusion to use atrovent and spirulina at the same time. Correct, and there, no one's done that study, and we and know the reason because the same company makes both, and they're not going to compare one to the other. Uh, and Well, some eterol and albuterol yeah, are different. Albuterol. Yeah, but that one's sure. long and one's short. Yeah, he's talking about like ketogen versus uh, atrovent. Uh, so, so, so you're you're right. That, I guess that would be analogous, yeah, and we don't. The thing with this one is, you know, I don't know if for people with mild disease who are asymptomatic and they don't have an exacerbation, I think most of us who put them on albuterol as opposed to taking an atrovirol and other kind of as needed medication. But this suggests differently that actually for exacerbation. And so, so, so what I would tell you is, first of all, to remember the era when a lot of, we, we went back 30 years in terms of our search. So nobody's doing studies in 2015 comparing albuterol to ipratropium. 20 years ago, people were doing that. And the other thing is the only outcome that we looked at for this study was acute exacerbations. So... It doesn't mean that, you you know, if, if the person's dyspnea is relieved more quickly with the albuterol or if there's something else that you're looking at that you think is better, that may be the important reason to use the other. So I wouldn't suggest that that would make you change your practice. I would think that if you're thinking about being parsimonious in how many agents you use and if your goal is exacerbation prevention, that that might direct what you do. Um, That that's the sort of thing that you might take away from no, you always, this you time. Them. I mean, comes all of us. And it's just difficult in my mind as a pulmonologist to think of the anticholinergic medications long and short acting. Although what Jeff is saying is correct, we use lavas and uh, sabas, and we don't complain. About I've them. talked to you know I've talked to yeah. some of the guys at at, at Beringer about this, and and you know the scientists will tell you you know you're you're. If you, once this, the receptors are saturated, they're saturated. So if you saturate them with teotropium and you give them ipratropium, there's no reason to think you're going to have an effect. Moreover, I would more over the ability for TO for the once granted receptor alone is about 35 times that of, uh, of, of ipratropium. Right. So you actually are getting antagonistic effects if you actually saturate the receptor with ipratropium. But this is not what these guidelines are saying. That's the thing. There's no, there's no comparison of a lab. There's no comparison, but this. what you right. interpret as a whole later so on. So pharmacologically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If exacerbations are your only endpoint, pharmacologically, it doesn't make any sense to give it a short acting muscular and again, a Well, that, that's only on the assumption you're saturating all the receptors with teotropin, yeah. which has a lot of factors involved that patients age, how old are they in spring, spiraling. Because I've had a lot of patients who are. Like you said, they come in, they're on ipatropium along with their teotropium, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you that they take it extra, they feel better. The problem uh, they're probably not saturating all the receptors with the teotropium. Yeah, the, the problem is is that most of the people who are on both of those agents are not on it because of some sort of pharmacologic right. plan. They're on it because the doc <laughs> who prescribed them doesn't know about the yeah, drugs, that's right. and that's the reality. You know, to me, the biggest weaknesses of all these studies is they have two endpoints, death and exacerbation. Whatever happens is make the patient feel better. You know, and what every one of these studies should have, it was like a St. George's Index score. Uh, and while the patient's coming back every month, you can tell you, when he comes back every month, Doc, I don't feel that good yet. You put him on something else, or you add something onto it. So, you know, it's, I think our endpoints, one of these studies, leave a lot to be desired. 
Well, and the part of the purpose of the guideline is to point where more studies yeah. need to be done. Some of our other suggestions and recommendations was that were that we suggested a short-acting muscarinic and a short-acting uh, uh, beta agonist compared to a short-acting beta agonist alone to prevent exacerbation. So if they've got exacerbations, you should use both. Um, we suggested a LABA compared to a SAMA monotherapy to prevent exacerbations. We recommended a LAMA compared to a SAMA to prevent exacerbations. And we suggested the combination of a SAMA plus a LABA to LABA monotherapy to prevent exacerbations. And that's where <coughs> that data led us. So how about inhaled steroids? There have been um, recent systematic reviews from 55 studies. Uh, Long-term inhaled corticosteroids reduce exacerbations. And there's an increase of candidiasis and hoarseness, which I think we know. Long-term studies show no major effects on, on bone problems. Um, in terms of inhaled corticosteroids and a LABA compared to a single bronchodilator, there are a few long-term studies. A recent Cochrane analysis um, found that there was a large study with 11,000 patients, and um, ICS LABA reduces exacerbations, and there was a slight increase in the pneumonia risk. So you guys know what study I'm talking about there. And in terms of triple therapy, very little data. Um, recent review and um, Func lung function quality of life is improved and a marginal effect on exacerbations. So we recommended inhaled combination steroids and LABA um, compared to placebo, which is 1B. We recommended combination therapy compared to LABA monotherapy. And we recommended a maintenance combination compared to um, monotherapy for prevention of exacerbations. And uh, maintenance combination of ICS and LABA or inhaled LABA monotherapy are both effective. Yeah, this may be beyond the scope of what we're right. trying to address, but there's a lot of times you'll get patients that you'll prescribe them a combination ICS LABA, and then you'll get the insurance company that says, well, they haven't failed the ICS alone, so I have to give the ICS alone. Well, this recommendation has that. Does that go to governing bodies of some insurance companies that will say? Oh, that's I mean, that's yeah, one of the things. So one of the things that we, one of our goals of a guideline is to address physicians and their patients. And the goal is not to um, refer this to an insurance company. However, one would think, one would hope, that this is the kind of evidence that you could send to an insurance company and say, this is what the indication is right now. And there certainly are plenty of, uh, there's plenty of evidence that insurance companies or Medicare providers or Medicare payers use this data in terms of crafting their recommendations. They usually do it to restrict what we do and not to allow us to do something. Right. But nevertheless, that's where we think that the data is. I think the interesting thing for me about this is the recommendation of um, ICS and LAVAs together. Um, which isn't necessarily, it highlights some differences, I think, maybe from, from the strategy one might use with asthma. What's the difference between 24 and 21? 21 says use Advair before you actually So it means, no, so 21 means that you use Advair instead of Promoterol alone or, or some. Oh, the LABA, sorry. A LABA, yeah. And then um, we recommend LAMA, LABA therapy, or LAMA monotherapy, since both are effective for patients in stable COPD. And combination of um, all three are effective. Yeah. So you found no evidence that uh, ICS LABA is no more effective than LAMA alone? They're not compared that in that so way. No I wouldn't say there's no study, but there wasn't convincing evidence that said so. So what we said is either was good. Okay. So that would be 24 <coughs> that either are recommended. So those are the recommendations and suggestions. And then PICO3, um, which was interesting to me because I was 
most closely involved with that are these drugs. And so this is concerning antibiotics. Um, this is, do you put somebody on long-term antibiotics to prevent long-term exa exacerbations? And the forest plot is there from about three studies, so there's not a lot of work that's been done, but there is some data in favor. And um, you need to consider, um, we suggested the use of antibiotics to prevent uh, uh, exacerbations, and you have to think about QT interval and hearing loss and bacterial resistance in these patients, and I think those are all important. So if you're using macrolide to do this, I, I th personally I think that most people need to have their EKG and their hearing checked before you start therapy and then monitor that. In terms of corticosteroids for patients with an acute exacerbation, we suggested that systemic corticosteroids be given to prevent exacerbations in the first 30 days following uh, the initial exacerbation. And that, you see the forest plot there that favors that. Talk about no, because the different trials had different durations. And also, the different trials had different modes of administration. So more than one of these trials talked about IV and hospital patients, or others talked about oral. So we didn't address duration of the treatment. Well, back to those, they, they didn't talk about IM steroids. Correct. And that would be lack of data. <laughs> so, and this is important too. So, beyond 28 days, so if you've had the patient who had an exacerbation more than a month ago, giving steroids is for the sole purpose of preventing hospitalizations due to COPD after that 30-day window have not been proven to be effective in preventing exacerbations. So the short-term use after or associated with an exacerbation will prevent. The use after the 30-day window does not necessarily prevent exacerbations. You may have other reasons for giving them, but not for that. So chronic corticosteroids don't necessarily do that. There's lots of risks that we all know about with those drugs. So a PDE4 inhibitor, there's some evidence in favor of that. The drug is reflumolast. We suggested it, so it was a two-way recommendation, good data, weak. We, we, we only made this a weak recommendation despite the data. And the reason was that many patients have had to discontinue their therapy because of side effects. And I know I've had that circumstance occur. And there's li limited data in pa people who are getting inhaled agents and what we didn't address in this guideline, but which is important, is cost of the, the drug and ability to get it. This is an old drug, and um, lots of us don't use this drug anymore. And the interesting thing about it is there's actually data that's available for it. So we suggested that oral slow release theophylline has data to prevent acute exacerbations of COPD. And it's something to think about, um, even though it's fallen out of favor, that there's there's data which favor its use. Um, we suggested that there was a ther narrow therapeutic window. Um, there's adverse effects and there's interactions with medicines and smoking, which all of us older guys know all about. But um, it is a drug that, that can work, and it's something to keep in mind. And then for Zach, I, we, we put this in there. Um, this is a drug that few of us think about, but actually has some data to support. And some of that data is very recent. There's a study um, in 2014 um, that was prospective, randomized, and controlled that showed data that the use of this agent prevents acute exacerbations. And so this is also something to think about. We didn't have a strong recommendation here, but I think it's in those patients um, who are still having exacerbation despite other treatments, one might consider it. I think all those studies they administered with bronchodilators also would help you all before they gave it. The, the, the Zheng study was a good study, and I, I recommend that people look at it because if you if you look at that, it's it's actually pretty interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, oral. I was thinking of the <coughs> Gotcha. No, we used oral. These studies used oral uh, and acetylcysteine. Do you know how they did it then? I've never done it. Um, it's, it's a... The, 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 the dosage is 200, and I can't, I think that there were a couple of these studies that used 400 a day, 
in a couple that use 200 a day. And the side effect profile is very good. Um, these patients really don't have many problems with side effects. And um, the data is actually not bad. The earlier studies, when I looked at them, um, the two, the Hansen study and the Pellis study, both of them at least received their drug and I think received their support from the company that made it. But the Zheng study that was done here recently was pretty good. And um, I, th I think it's something to think about. Where did they get the net? Where did they get it from? They got it directly from the company that made it with their placebo. I've, I've, I've written for NAC for other reasons, and patients will take to the pharmacy, pharmacy will direct from the GNC. Mm -hmm. And the, the GNC, you actually go in and look, there's about 18 preparations in that of NAC, and I don't you know, they ask which one, I don't know. Well, you know, what they did is they went to the company and they right, got right. pills. So that's that's what they did. And what you would do, I mean, I could we could look up the, the company. I don't remember what it was off the top of my head. But, you know, at least there's something there that, that's to think about because it works. Yeah. Because Zach's done the same thing. We, we've, been, we've talked about that, how you could just get it over the counter. I just wonder how effective versus placebo effect. Well, something that works for pulmonary fibrosis, contrast to the problem with sympathy and translation of stents. Well, we need to put it in the water then. <laughs> no, not not so that I would know. We looked at these drugs because they were out there. Um, we didn't have very good data for carbocysteine, so it's possibly <laughs> indicated. And erdostein, uh, we had no data on but we included them. And there's a recent New England Journal article about statins that showed that they don't work. It was, you shouldn't do that. But they do have a study showing that statins inhibit fibrosis in a petri dish. Oh, well, that may be. So our suggested, none of, none of the oral therapies were recommended. Um, they were all suggested, a macrolides, NAC, um, and theophylines and PDE inhibitors and steroids may all uh, improve outcomes. Um, and then there's some that we didn't recommend. So I think that um, this is an area we wanted to develop a guideline for. And it provides a framework for collaboration, but it also provides some guidance for treatment and prevention of acute exacerbations, and also highlights where further research needs to be done. That's it. Any questions? Oh, that's right. It doesn't work. Oh,